What you're about to hear is two different episodes of the Untold Stories of Innovation podcast spliced together. I had the pleasure of speaking with Leslie Crone two times in 2020, first at the beginning of the year before the COVID-19 pandemic began, and then again in September when it was already in full swing and Argonne National Lab had been completing a lot of research initiatives around the pandemic in support of it. Listen in as we start by talking about COVID-19 in our conversation in September, and then stay tuned because we'll insert the conversation that I had with Leslie back in the beginning of 2020 at the end of this episode. Enjoy. Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout-Taylor. Back with us today on the podcast is Leslie Crone. She is Chief Communications Officer of Argonne National Laboratory. Leslie, it is wonderful to have you back on the podcast. The world is quite different since you and I first spoke at the beginning of 2020. Indeed it is. (laughs) Can you tell us about the changing times from Argonne's perspective and how the National Lab is responding? Sure. I, I think that uh, it's, it has been, you know, the, 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 the word of the year is unprecedented, right? Um, uh, and it has been that. Uh, for communicators, uh, you know, it has been in some ways just an affirmation of our profession, right? We have never been more needed, <laughs> uh, more valued, uh, and that's been a wonderful thing. Uh, I think the folks on my team certainly uh, really, really enjoy um you know, how much value they've been able to add uh, over the the course of the pandemic. So, you know, I think from Argonne's perspective, um, you know, the laboratory uh, is a very physical campus. There's a lot of activity that only can happen in the lab spaces uh, in our facilities. And so when we hit uh, the middle of March and realized that we needed to, to shelter in place and and begin large large scale teleworking. The lab had to move into what we call um, minimum safe operations. Right, you know, we're mm-hmm. keeping the lights on, we're keeping uh, very expensive facilities and equipment protected and safe. And um, you know, so so as we approached that, you know, our, our first priority was the safety of our people and, and our facilities. Right, so um, we very quickly, you know, in the span of a few days, really um, moved to large scale teleworking. We went from having upwards of 5,000 people on our campus on an average daily basis to about 400, uh, 450. Um, So a dramatic reduction in our on-site population, had to shut a lot of things down uh, safely, Um, had to equip uh, 93% of our workforce to be able to be productive uh, from home offices. Uh, We had to do a little shuffling of technology and a fair number of chairs (laughs) to, (laughs) to get to get, to get everybody ergonomically situated for what is, and I think will continue to be a long haul of extended telework. Um, so, you know, keeping our people safe um, at the lab and at home really has been our first priority. Um, there was a certain amount of work that we knew we wanted to continue to do as the lab was in in this minimum safe operations mode. And, and we've opened it up a little bit now um, to what we call limited operations. But amongst some of that high priority work was research that was directly contributed to the pandemic itself. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about that later. But um, making sure that we had um, the appropriate researchers as well as the safety uh, professionals who needed to be on site if work's going on on campus, uh, making sure that that was all uh, set up uh, for success, but layering in all the additional safety precautions that needed to be added in to our normal safety routines. Um, you know, working as everyone is very familiar with face coverings now, with shielding, uh, you know, face face shields, work workplace shields, um, uh, getting all that in place, you know, was really our focus at the beginning. Um, and then, you know, as the pandemic has un- unfolded, right, um, different things become uh, more challenging or less challenging. It took us a couple of weeks, you know, to figure out teleworking, but teleworking ceased to be sort of a conversation of the day. Um, and as summer came and kids were out of school, childcare became, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a bigger topic. And 
as the pandemic, we now we're, we're, we're back into a return to school phase, which is another whole issue, a uh, set of issues for our caregivers. So, you know, Argonne has had to respond to all of these different things. Um, and again, I go back to what I started with the communications, uh, you know, sort of function has had to really step in and help make sure that everybody knows what's going on and, and, and what we're doing and when we're doing it and how we expect people to do things. And, uh, so communications has just really been the, the, the big uh, glue that's held it all together as we've tried to keep people safe. Um, you know, so I think that's one of the biggest ways that Argonne has responded. I, I think the second thing that I would mention really has to do with our, our commitment to contributing to the solutions to the pandemic, to keeping the science going. Uh, and I think uh, there's four different areas where Argonne has been contributing when it comes to, to the science of COVID. Uh, you know, the first thing is how do you understand the virus, right? What does it look like structurally, you know, and, and how do receptors on the virus map to potential drug targets? And we do a lot of that imaging work um, with our, our big X-ray microscope that we talked about the last on the last podcast, the uh, advanced photon source. So understanding that virus and, and adding that knowledge to the global scientific community is a big, big priority. Um, we had a team of folks testing uh, face covering materials for effectiveness early on. Uh, a lot of that work was published, um, you know, back in the April, May timeframe as people are trying to figure out, well, how do I wear these face coverings and what's the best material? Um, we had another set of uh, people focused on modeling the spread of the virus. Uh, and uh, we actually uh, have been advising both the city of Chicago, the county of Cook County in Illinois and the governor of Illinois, you know, on how the virus is likely to spread if we, you know, put certain restrictions in place for, for the population, limiting gatherings or um, asking people to shelter in place. Or if you see a 20% versus a 50% versus a 70% compliance on the masking and distancing uh, regulation. So the epidemiological modeling work has been another big contribution from the laboratory. And the last one is, is the work our supercomputers are doing in um, helping everything related to therapeutics, right? So whether it's vaccine uh, related or it's treatment related, you know, what are the uh, compounds that are out there that are most likely to be effective and, and, and narrow the trial and error that can be part of, of that exercise, right? You've got a lot of potential drug compounds. Which ones are most likely to work? Which ones do you want to put, you know, into trials, you know, quickly? So those are the, you know, the two priorities, keeping our people safe and, and contributing to the COVID um, solutions. That's really... Uh, how Argonne has been responding six months, six months in. Yeah. Well, thank you, first of all, for sharing that inside view and for explaining the four key areas of research and contribution that Argonne has been making to this pandemic. I I am blown away by that. And I'm, I know that um, everyone should be incredibly grateful and interested in this science. And one of the things that we talked about in our first episode was public distrust of science or misunderstanding of science. And I, I made that point and, and you actually countered to say, you know, recent research is showing that scientists are actually um, held in the highest regard in general, in the general public, um, and according to some new research that just came out. And so what's been shocking, you know, you said unprecedented um, as the kind of key word for 2020. And, and I think what's been the most concerning from my view to watch is the ways in which the general public has really expressed a lot of distrust among public health experts or towards the science and the medicine, medical facts um, behind this, this uh, virus. And so could you share, I would love to know if you've, I'm sure you've been grappling with that as well. And especially, you know, as chief communications, as the leader, really trying to figure out how do we communicate this research and these insights, especially I'm thinking where you're doing that modeling work to say, okay, if 50% of people wear their mask, here's how spread will happen. And if only 20%, here's how much more spread will happen. I imagine that that really has a direct impact, those kinds of models on helping people understand or get behind and support public health experts. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. So, you know, I did, you know, in advance of this, you know, take a look at some very recent data. Um, I, I happened to 
uh, appreciate the work that Heart and Mind Strategies uh, does, and they've been tracking um, American uh, public opinion uh, and trust in, in a variety of different uh, institutions and organizations since the beginning of the pandemic. And I also looked at some other University of Chicago research, some Pew research data. You know, so I, when it comes to trust, it's shifting, right? You know, since in the last six months, trust is shifting. What I found interesting is the trust in medicine and science in particular was high, you know, kind of upper 50s, you know, in terms of a percentage of the population who has, you know, a reasonable amount or a high amount of trust in, in science. Um, that number is increasing, right? So, so the medical community, the scientific community is gaining in trust in the last six months. Um, the other group that, that seems to be rising is employers, right? So employers, they were kind of more in the mid-30s in terms of what percentage of the population trusts employers, but that number is going up, right? And they see employers doing the right thing, right? Putting um, uh, protocols in place where they say, if you come on our campus, and Argonne has done this, we've, we've published what we call the Argonne Health Pact. And it says, if you are on our campus, we expect you to distance, to wash your hands a lot, to stay home if you're sick, you know, all those good behaviors. Um, so when people see employers doing those kinds of things, trust rises. And we're seeing that, right? We're seeing employers take those right precautions. You think about all of the publicity the airlines have had on their cleaning procedures and all those kinds of things. That, that's helping increase trust in employers. You know, the government and, and different governmental agencies um, and nationally and, and globally, right? Um, they were in the mid 40s, right? Higher level of trust originally than employers, but we see that falling, right? And, and there's lots of media out there and um, media is the other area where trust in media was in the low 20s and that's falling as well, right? So that's, those are, you know, what's documented in some of the research that I've pulled you know, to say trust is is really shifting. What I think is interesting, in addition, is that trust in science and medicine, uh, as you alluded to, has been stable for decades, right? It is, it, it's, it's high, right? You know, 50 plus percent of people trust science and medicine, and it's been that way for a long, 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 long time. So it's increasing a little bit now, but it's just holding steady, which is great. And I think the other thing is that Pew's study in particular, you know, asks people, do you believe that these entities and these organizations are acting in the best interest of the public? And 80 plus percent believe science and medicine is acting in the best interest of the public. It's not, not near the, those levels if you're talking about employers or the media or, you know, some other uh, institution. So, so, so I think helpful. in general, it, it is a great base for the lab to be communicating from, right? So when we go out there and we do a public lecture, and, and we did one uh, in May, on three of those four topics that I mentioned, we talked about the advanced photon source and imaging the virus and the epidemiological modeling as well as how the supercomputers are helping, you know, um, with the therapeutics. Um, and that you can kind of go out to the Argonne website and take a look at if you wanted to. But that, you know, when you have, you know, we had an audience of like 900 people on that, um, that lecture, uh, which was awesome. So people are hungry for the information, you know, and if you listen to the questions and you watch the, the, the chat, you know, people, they're just even hungry for more and more and more. Right. Um, so I think that, you know, there's just a, a, a trust in science and they've had nothing but a great stage to tell their stories on for, you know, for the last six months. We will link the research articles um, that Leslie mentioned in the show notes for this episode, and I think that'll be really interesting to to dive into and look at um, if you're interested in in learning more about that. Um, tell us a little bit more. I, I love that you are hosting webinars. We can link to those as well um, if you'd like to share, you know, a, a certain resources on Argon site or or you know it, areas where we can be listening in and, and get gleaning stories and insights from your scientists as well. Sure. Yeah, I'll get you the link to the Out Loud lecture. And we have a spot on our website that is just our, our science related to COVID. And I can send you that link as well. Wonderful. Well, Leslie, is there anything else you'd like to share about Argonne's response and, you know, what we should all be paying attention to as innovators in the midst of this pandemic? Um. Well, you know, I mean, I think that um, it's interesting to think, too, about how the science and the research is evolving a little bit, right, as we go through the crisis, um, you know, uh, because 
science can be a, a slow, um, a methodical, a rigorous right process, and, and not to say that it isn't, but um, we just did a, a media interview uh, the other day talking about the speed with which uh, the scientific community, the pharmaceutical community, you know, are, are moving. Uh, when the, you know, pursuit of the vaccines and the therapeutic and the treatment options and things like that, you know, so there has been an incredible global eagerness to jump in and, and find funding and move quickly and share results, right? Yes. I, I think that's changed and shifted and it's all for the better. Uh, you know, scientific collaboration was always strong. I just think it's even stronger now, right? Mm -hmm. So, yes. um, that that all is also wonderful to see uh you know sort of on the downside it's kind of interesting how challenging it has been to do you know science is inherently a global enterprise right um you know global facilities global communities of expertise etc and you know the lack of travel has sort of challenged that in in a way that's um let's call it unprecedented um you know so uh, but i see the scientific community you know sort of trying to figure out, you know, how to, how to compensate for that. Right. So I think there's some, some changes in how research is, is, is being done. Um, and the other thing I, I think I noticed, you know, in this whole time frame has to do with how much non COVID science is still moving forward. Right. It's not like we hit the pause button on everything else. Um, you know, just in the last two months, um, Argonne has been part of announcing, you know, sort of the, the national quantum internet, um, back in July, and, and the Department of Energy and the White House announced five quantum centers and seven artificial intelligence centers uh, just a, a few weeks ago. Um, we're doing groundbreaking ceremonies and ribbon-cutting ceremonies on new facilities at the laboratory. You know, so as much as you think everybody's been focused on COVID, there's a whole lot of non-COVID stuff that is proceeding as well. So um, science is certainly evolving as, <laughs> as we deal with the pandemic. It's so good to hear that. And I'm so, I'm grateful to have that insider look at how collaboration has become virtual. And I, I think, you know, international collaboration perhaps can be accelerated even faster now that everyone is virtual. So it's it's just wonderful to hear those stories. And Leslie, I'm so grateful for this update. Um, I can't wait to share it with all of our listeners so that they can be tuning in to those lectures and also learning more about trust and storytelling and information sharing during the pandemic. Thank you so much for joining us again on the podcast. Oh, you're very welcome. Talk to you soon. Okay. Take care. Leslie, you have such an incredible background in communications, especially for scientific disciplines and organizations. I'm so grateful to have you on the podcast today. It is a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. So I'd love to start by learning a little bit more about where your personal story of innovation began. I think that it all began early in my career. I was working for Anderson Consulting, uh, which turned into Accenture. And one of the things that I was tasked with was managing an internal meeting, a, a partner meeting. But it was in the mid-90s, and it was really the advent of the Internet. And as a consulting organization, Accenture was trying to figure out how to convince and convey the fact to their own employees that they were leading in this innovative area called the internet. And so the managing partner said to me, I said, we, we've got to make people believe that we're actually doing this stuff. We're on the leading edge of it. And so, you know, what we brought to that meeting, that event was a lot of innovative techniques to get people to think differently about things, to convince them to inspire passion and belief. One of the things in particular that we did it for that meeting was we used the partner's own children to convey to them how the paradigm was shifting. And we interviewed these kids and we said, well, what, what are computers to you? And they're like, you mean like air, like electricity, <laughs> like three-year-olds were able to convey instantly wow. how different the, the grown-ups needed to think about this new technology. So I, I think that was really the beginning of it was, you know, when the internet hit early in my career, it was like, whoa, that's, that's innovation. Things are different. 
It's so interesting, too, to hear that perspective that the innovators did not necessarily see themselves as innovators. Is that something that you've come across uh, throughout your career, that that there's certain messaging or certain stories that are useful for helping uh, employees see themselves as innovative? I think that's true because it's hard for people to see what they don't know. If your experience is always of new and different and change, then you take that in stride. But if your experience is not, you look at that as differently. So I do think it is hard sometimes for innovators to see themselves as innovative. Also because innovators are always seven steps ahead of where you think they are as a communicator. They're telling, you're helping them tell today's story, but a real innovator is already 10 years down the road. That's fascinating. So, you know, you've worked with so many incredible big companies, large innovative companies, Nielsen, Sara Lee, GE, you've mentioned Accenture. Can you share with me and our listeners more insight into how storytelling made a difference in in those different organizations? Uh, It it sounds like you've always played a role as being sort of a chief, uh, you know, marketing communications and uh, in so many ways that, that also involves storytelling. Could you share some stories around your work in those different organizations? Well, I think they do all share similarities. And my role has always been of counselor and advisor. And inevitably, the organizations that I'm supporting want to be known, want to be recognized, want to be heard. And they, they, they want to be seen as different. They want to stand out. Storytelling is just a mechanism to make things memorable. Um, people can recount stories better than facts and figures most of the time. Uh, And and so I think that in any of the roles that I've been in, I try and employ classic storytelling techniques. Uh, You can adapt them to the situation, but I look for stories that have a beginning and a middle and an end. You know, once upon a time, the internet came along and then (laughs) this happened to it and then this happened. Um, You can talk about protagonists and antagonists, um, not necessarily people, but situations, Mm -hmm. uh, you know. And how can a technology be the protagonist against something called, you know, an environmental uh, issue or concern? Uh, I think about conflict and resolution, right? So product marketing is often conflict and resolution. You've got a problem and you have a technology or an innovation that helps remove, uh, you know, the, the, the problem. So I think storytelling just enables people to remember because they're, classic techniques that they're used to. It's how they learn. It's how they were raised. So it's just employ those and it helps with this memorability of the message. Yeah, that's that's such an excellent point. I'm thinking, you know, too, about the the importance of storytelling to the practice of innovation, to innovation processes, to the success of the innovation team. Could you share uh, your perspectives on why storytelling matters, particularly to innovation? Well, I I can give you a story from Argonne that I think illustrates both the storytelling but also the importance to the organization. So Argonne is a a national laboratory. We work on innovations, generally speaking, 10 years before they ever hit the mainstream. Uh, We worked on the electrochemistry and electric car batteries 10 years before the Chevy Volt came off of a production line. There's a story that... uh, is interesting to hear about a product that we call the oleo sponge. And if I think about the storytelling, you know, on this one, it definitely has a a beginning and a middle and an end. It it has a protagonist and an antagonist, as I mentioned before. So sort of like in the beginning, there was a piece of polyurethane foam, the kind that you and I are probably sitting on right now. And uh, (laughs) in and of itself, it's cushy, but that's about it. And some of our scientists created... um, a new material, a coating for that piece of polyurethane foam. And that the properties of that coating are that it loves oil. So if you coat the foam in the, uh, this new material and you put it in a situation, call it a, a pond that's got some oil scum from motorboats, it will wick the oil right out of the water. And so you have the foam and it meets the coating. And now you have this innovation called what we've, we've dubbed it the oleo sponge. And we, so now we have the, the hero is the sponge, you know, the antagonist here is the oil. Um, 
and we've got a solution that's innovative. So for the laboratory, our job is now to transfer that technology to industry. So we need to be able to tell that story in a way that gets industry excited for it. So what kind of industries might be excited about it? Well, the one that seemed the most obvious to us were, were environmental concerns, mm -hmm. right? So uh, it's it's a product that uh, industrial companies might, might need. Um, they took the product uh, and they tested it in a variety of different environments. One in particular that they did was an ocean test. Mm. And uh, we took that product also down to uh, the Dallas EarthX conference about two years ago, which actually has both an industrial component to it, but also a general public thing. And we demonstrated it, right? So people could walk up and down the aisle and see exactly how this oleo sponge works. They could do it themselves. But what was also fascinating is as you demonstrate the innovation, people came up with other applications for the product. There were women who walked by and said, can I have one of them for my, my kitchen sink? I want to do dishes with that thing. And we were like, we hadn't even thought of that. And right. other people came by and said, I'd, I'd like that for makeup. You know, I want, I want some of that on my face. <laughs> um, so I think the innovation, you know, by telling the story in a memorable way to say, you know, chronologically, we started with this, we added that, we came up with this thing that's new and it can do all these heroic things. People remembered that, and then the ideas started to fly about how else they could use it. So it helped advance Argonne's goals uh, and, you know, helps the planet, too. So it's all good. I love that story. It, it uh, You know, in the past year at Untold Content, we have analyzed different innovation stories, and it's one of the that, – that analysis is one of the reasons why we started this podcast. One of the outcomes of that research was that we identified a lot of different story patterns. And the one that you just shared, we'd sort of call it the surprise discovery. And uh, there's, there's another one that I think this might overlap with it, which is the perspiring innovator. So if there's a particular challenge, uh, if you continue to innovate against it, eventually you hope anyhow that it leads to breakthrough. Um, but that one particularly is, is somewhat surprising because you start with this concept of this is something in your everyday life. It's pretty typical polyurethane. We're sitting on it now. And then you show this dynamic and very unique application for it. Uh, and it, it sort of draws listeners in and helps them understand in a different way. And and I think there's something else that I would add about that story. And if you think about the complexity of the materials development that went into this, you definitely are in the perspiring innovator <laughs> zone. Uh, they worked years and years to yes. you know, come up with the right formulations. However, when we went to tell the story, uh, you know, part of the communications journey is there were a lot of different audiences that were interested in hearing it. And we were particularly successful telling the oleo sponge at a different level of technical complexity and sophistication depending on the audience. So, you know, you can certainly start with a 24 page scientific paper published in a journal, which is appropriate for certain audience. Yes. But you also have to figure out how to tell that story to people who aren't material scientists and who aren't PhDs in science and, you know, who are business people who understand the application of it, but not the chemical composition of it all the way down to, to a point where, and I think this was one of the things that I loved most when I, first came to Argonne is there's a 10 second video of the oleo sponge. There is not a word of narrative narration. There's not a word of, of text anywhere. It simply shows a beaker of water into which you pour oil that is colored blue so you can see it. And you drop the sponge in and the oil all goes into the sponge. You tell that story without a single word. And, and so being able to tell a story at all those different levels of length and complexity is also a key thing about telling innovation stories. You got to be able to scale the story up or down to the audience. Absolutely. And one of the one of the issues I wanted to discuss with you uh, on this episode is really about alignment, which involves getting buy-in or getting feedback from internal stakeholders, external stakeholders, collaborators, and really ensuring that the the innovations and the prototypes and the the research questions you're asking are in alignment with the mission of the organization. And I would say at Argonne as well, I'm sure you're also contemplating industry partnerships and how to solve real market needs in our community as well as societal needs that you hear um, as as a public institution. So many different audiences 
at so many different learning uh, and technical literacy levels. Can you share with me your thoughts on uh, why alignment, uh, you know, matters so much to to the work of innovation and how when an innovation story is not well aligned with different audience needs, how it's at so much greater risk for failure or not getting to that next stage of approval? Yeah, there's two two ways to look at the alignment issue. Certainly one is the, the customer needs and from a corporate industry perspective, you know, you, you want to focus on things that there is market demand for. Um, at the lab, you know, the mission is is both serving industry need, but it, it, it's also laying the foundation for decades of future innovation. And so there's a ma- there's a certain amount of basic exploratory discovery science uh, where you don't exactly know what you're looking for. And when you find things, you're not exactly sure what you're going to use them for, but you need to do that work. There's yes. just discovery is so essential to to the national laboratories, um, certainly, and many other R&D institutions. Um, I think that finding a home for the stories as you were telling them is a completely different kind of exercise. Um, And so the laboratory here does work from basic discovery science to energy work, uh, working with the grid and nuclear and renewables. We do work with, uh, we have a big photon sciences uh, sector that does testing for pharmaceutical compounds and all kinds of novel materials. We have computing, supercomputing, where we're doing all kinds of data visualizations and and crunching incredible amounts of data to figure out new treatments for diseases that are crippling to to humanity right now. Mm -hmm. The, The question of how to tell an Argonne story and build an Argonne brand using that range and that diversity of stories was was a different kind of a challenge. And sure. And with that, we really said part of our mission is to discover. So we want to tell stories of discovery. Mm-hmm. And every time we tell a story of discovery, we're building the Argon brand. We also knew we told stories of collaboration because a lot of times these innovations come about because of collaborations. Uh, a, a great example of that is, is our work in the battery space, where we are partnering with many of the other national laboratories, we're partnering with universities, we're partnering with industry, uh, you know, and together through those collaborations, they're able to create leaps and bounds improvements in terms of energy density and cost and and things of that nature. So, you know, if we tell those stories, we're aligned with the, the, the brand and the reputation that we're trying to build for the laboratory. I mean, there certainly are times before, I think that people would come in and say, well, that innovation's a little off strategy. But to figure that out, we reframed how we told stories. You know, we're telling stories of collaboration. We're telling stories of innovation. We're telling stories, too, about the facilities and the scale of this national laboratory because it is, we can fit Wrigley Field inside one of the, the facilities <laughs> that we have here. Uh, we're operating at a scale that's unprecedented almost anywhere. You know, there are right. other national laboratories, certainly. But we had to just reframe how we created that alignment. Absolutely. That makes sense. And and you started with uh, an overarching sort of universal concept of discovery, and that then can apply across sectors and across scientific disciplines. Absolutely. Could you speak to the role of storytelling, especially in scientific communications? And I'm thinking especially about some research lately around the death of expertise and uh, the, the average taxpayer's misunderstandings of science or, or distrust of science and, and of expertise and, and even being able to sort of uh, come together around what truth is, is a challenge these days societally. Could you speak to then, you know, why storytelling matters from that perspective? And if you have certain strategies that you sort of try to um, diffuse across Argonne and, and across scientists and the experts there to help the public understand what scientists are doing, why it matters, and why we should trust in those efforts. Well, you're absolutely right. It's documented that, uh, you know, people's trust of any kind of media is eroding. Um, people's understanding, uh, scientific acumen is, is lower. Uh, but the good news is that 
It's also documented that people's trust of scientists as spokespeople, as storytellers, is still extraordinarily high. It's, you know, in the top kind of three Mm -hmm. uh, trusted sources of information. So there's a wonderful base to build on there. I I think that the key to communicating with the public um, is making your stories relatable. And so I, I frequently counsel folks that I'm working with to not talk about the molecule, right? Talk about sure. why the molecule matters. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times, you know, it's easy for um, people to focus on the technical stuff and not the what's in it for me. And so that's a classic communications uh, principle. The audience needs to know why they should care. And it isn't necessarily a scientist's instinct to lead with that. They, they want to sure. lead with, you know, the formula, the algorithm, and, and that's okay. That's the discovery. Uh, but what I've found and what I coach my team to do is tease that out of them. You know, why does this discovery matter? Um, it's about making the discovery relatable and, and being able to talk about it in terms that people understand. You know, like with the oleo sponge, you can talk extraordinarily technical about that. You sure. can talk at a level that a highly educated, science-interested person can, could understand, and, and at the level that a five-year-old could understand. Um, and that doesn't mean that you're dumbing it down. You're just, to me, it mess- your communications is only effective if your message is received. And so you really have to scale how you talk about it. So I think that's the key is working with the subject matter experts to understand why it would matter. Where is this applicable? How can we connect this to something that people care about? We did an announcement uh, over a year ago around some quantum technology. And I think the general population is still struggling with quantum and what is quantum physics and quantum mechanics and quantum networks and quantum computing. And, um, you know, but when we were able to say right now, the integrity of, of communications between, you know, inside a country, for instance, if you think about security or you mm-hmm. think about warfare, you think about this integrity of communications inside of business with com- competitiveness and confidentiality and all that kind of stuff. Like this notion of unhackable networks was something that people understood. Yes. And all of a sudden you had their attention and you could then start to explain to them why this particular development in the quantum space was going to matter. You know, again, the lab is 10 years ahead of at least, you know, sort of where a lot of innovations end up showing up out in the outside world. But, but people can understand that concept. And by hooking it into something that people could relate to, they're like, okay, I get it. And if that's going to help us be more safe, more secure, you know, then they're interested. Absolutely. So relatability um, and impact. Are, impact. Are really... That's it. Those are the two big words. Two big words I say them all the time. Why is that so difficult, do you think, especially um, in scientific disciplines? Well, I think that part of it is that generally there's a lot more discoveries to come after the one that you're talking about particularly. And there's no guarantee how any of those are going to, uh, how they'll come out. How, yeah, I, I had a scientist tell me once, um, he said, well, I don't like to do storytelling because when I was a child, when I was, when someone said to me, you're telling stories, it meant you were lying. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. it can be an ingrained uh, thing that scientists feel sort of cautious about over exaggeration and, and so reliant on the data and the evidence that they can s- actually sort of miss the opportunity to make it relatable. I think that's absolutely real. Um, the, I, I hear frequently, we, we don't want to say that because that will sound like hyperbole. We're, <laughs> we're exaggerating. Sure, and, sure, and sure. so they do want to sort of stick to the data. But I think that there's a middle ground a yeah. lot of times. And, and I do think it's a communicator's job to push a little bit to understand where the boundaries are. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes they are not as close in as the scientist might want them to be, nor are they as far out as the communicator would want them to be. Uh, and so that is a lot of times just good, honest conversation and a reality check and, uh, and that kind of stuff. But that, that struggle is, is, is real in terms of wanting to not over-exaggerate what's happening. And as I said, there's so much runway between today's discovery and the end use of an innovation that is very hard to predict. And that makes a lot of people uncomfortable, understandably. And again, too, I keep, 
as you say that, I keep thinking back to that overarching mission of discovery. And again, if you can find a universal truth and unite people around it, I, I think the public also wants has that desire to teach our children to be discoverers, to be curious, to think outside of the box, as as it were. And so um, finding that moment of relatability, again, I think can help uh, sort of bridge that challenge. I do think that curiosity uh, as a value is inherent in every one of the science uh, scientists that I've worked with. They they just want to know why. Why does this happen? Or why didn't that happen? I expected this and, and it didn't. And, you know, they also are inherently curious about there's got to be a better way, right? You know, there's got to yes. be a better way to feed 10 billion people on a planet of our size. There's mm-hmm. got to be a better way to get the water on the planet to the dry places that need it. There's got to be a better way to get fresh drinking water when the planet's covered with so much of it. <laughs> yes. It, it, and, and that curiosity is what moves us forward as a society. You know, it's, it's absolutely critical. And uh, it's, children have that, you know, they have it. And, and I just, I commend everybody who does all the work in the STEM fields to nurture that and bring that out in, in children and grow, you know, their, their interest in science and how they think about themselves as someone who can be curious and explore and solve problems because that's what we need. We need a lot of that. Yeah, amen to that. You know, I'd love to hear your advice to innovators, especially scientific innovators, uh, around how they can better utilize stories to get buy-in for the the curious ideas that they're developing. Well, I think we've mentioned them already, but I'll summarize them. So I, I think impact is really important. Um and that's helping the scientists understand that we need to tease that nugget out. It's there and they always know it. It's just not maybe front, front and center. And so focusing on the impact is, is crucial because the impact is what's going to make people care. Uh, if it doesn't have any impact, the, the people will pass that mm-hmm. nugget by. So mm-hmm. impact is really, really key. I think the relatability piece, the why it matters is a second piece of that, right? So Um, people, you can say you're going to cure cancer. Okay, fine. But you got to relate it to, to people, right? So if you're talking about prostate cancer, you're talking about brothers and fathers and husbands. And if you're talking about Alzheimer's, you know, you're, you're talking about people's elder statesmen in their families and, Mm -hmm. and that becomes the relatable nugget, right? They kind of conceptually understand Alzheimer's or cancer, but the relatability is how does it connect to them? And so there's two, there are two pieces there. And so sometimes there's a whole lot of what ifs with the scientists to say, so would this be applicable in this situation? Would it be applicable in this other situation? And then you're able to come up with a nugget, you know, so I can talk about unhackable networks. Okay, fine. But in what context? Right. So, the impact and the relatability are, are part and parcel of what you need to anchor your story. Um, and then I think that, you know, I would advise the scientists that they really have to be mindful of the jargon uh, of the technical talk. And, and they've got to, you know, put in a little bit of effort to scale that sophistication, the technical or scientific sophistication, depending on who the audience is. So they may be presenting at a technical conference on Monday, and they may be talking to the Wall Street Journal on Tuesday, and those are two different presentations, even though they can be talking about the same subject, the same impact, the same relatability. And and so I I advise them to put in that that effort and try and scale their story appropriately for the audience. Um, It's kind of fun if you want to do an experiment take any two people and have one pretend that they're from the modern day era and have the other one pretend that they're from the, you know, 1776 when the country was founded and have the one from the modern day era explain what a cell phone is (laughs) without using words that that somebody 300, 250 years ago would understand. Right. It's really, really hard. Yes. A a letter that floats through the air and immediately goes into your ear. (laughs) Right. I would call somebody on my phone. Well, call them. They didn't have calls. The calls, they had calling cards on a little business card and a butler brought it in on a tray. (laughs) Um, 
I, I think it's it's a lot harder than anybody thinks mm-hmm. to tell scientific stories well um, with all respect for the rigor that goes into the science and the facts uh, and, and and making things relatable and understandable. It's it's really, really hard work. And my hat's off to all the people who love to do this, because when you find scientific communicators, they are passionate about what they do. So, Yes. And, and it seems the stakes are, are just getting higher and higher to be able to make science relatable and to reveal its impact so that organizations like Argonne will continue to be funded and industry will continue to invest research in uh, in that funding. And so, um, you know, I it's think crucial. It, it's absolutely crucial. So as we wrap up, I'd love to hear your your sort of take on it, it's 2020 what innovation story mediums and methods do you think we'll see uh, this year and into the future what new ways do you think scientists will be trying to communicate uh, for instance I there's a pretty popular meme right now going around where dissert- as people finish up their dissertations they dance their dissertation and put it on the internet it's very it's kind of silly it's also fascinating sometimes to watch dance your dissertations so uh, obviously that one's kind of a silly example but um, I've seen comic strips and uh, art installations to try to explain and make science relatable to the public. What do you think we might see uh, into the future in that regard? Well, I am not a fortune teller. I'm a storyteller. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I don't know. Um, although I can tell you, I do think that there are uh, people doing some fascinating things. And when you mentioned the art, I remember being at the British Museum in London and Someone was trying to make a point about how much medicine, you know, people take in their life. And so they they wove a piece of fabric, you know, just some muslin type fabric, and they embedded in that fabric pills, right? So here's two Advil for this headache, and here's the melatonin I took to sleep on an airplane, and here's what I took for my cough and my flu, and... But they they had data behind this Mm -hmm. that showed what the average number of pills or medicines an individual took over an average lifespan. And to see that essentially sewn into a piece of cloth told the story of medicine over over a lifetime. That wow. shows impact yes. and that shows relatability. And that was art. Yes. That was not a scientific journal. Yes, so right. I, I love those types of innovative ways to tell a story. No words required. Maybe there's a little caption in the museum or something like that. But it stuck with me. Yes. I mean, it was like years ago. So great stories will resonate. I don't know what the new forms will be. <laughs> I, I, I could never could have predicted the rise of social media sure, uh, sure. in my career. So I'm not going to guess in the future, but I, I'll leave you with that example of a of a piece of scientific research communicated extraordinarily innovatively that stuck. I love it. Thank you so much, Leslie. It's been such an honor to talk with you. You're very welcome. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content.